Dina, thank you. All right. Well, it looks like we've got a pretty good crowd, so uh, I'll get started with the introduction. Uh, yeah, so our, so our speaker today is uh, Mario Vallejo Marin, and his, the title of his talk is Evolution and Functional Significance of uh, Anthracones in Buzz Pollinated Solanum. So Mario was born in Mexico City and studied biology at uh, UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico, uh, studying plant herbivore interactions and then went on to do a PhD at Duke studying the evolutionary significance of Andromanesi and uh, using Solanum carolinensi as a model. Um, and that is where I really got going with uh, Solanum work. Um, afterwards, I went on to do a postdoc at the University of Toronto studying plant reproductive strategies in Brazilian water plants and on the evolution of heteranthery using uh, Solanum as a model also. And since 2008, uh, Mario has had a permanent position at the University of Stirling in Scotland and is currently an associate professor. Uh, and uh, the lab there studies, uh, conducts research on speciation, hybridization, polyploidy, and buzz pollination. And uh, one of Mario's favorite scientific discoveries was finding and describing a new species of monkey flower that is younger than Darwin's origin of species. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So that's. Uh, I'll uh, turn it over to you, Mario, and you can go ahead and share your screen and get started. Great. Th thank you very much, uh, uh, Luke, for, for that uh, really nice introduction. I'm, I'm going to share my, uh, my screen and see if... Um, yes. And also, thank you to the organizers of the Solanesi seminar for inviting me to present uh, some of my, my work here. I'm really, really excited to speak to this crowd, uh, in part because I, I know uh, very well the work of, of most of you and I followed it for um, a while and uh, it's always uh, uh, really interesting and inspirational for my work in Solanum. Also because, you know, I, I, I love uh, this uh, plant group and I, I'm very excited to tell you a little bit about the, the work that we've been doing uh, to try to understand uh, the morphological evolution in this in this genus and how it relates to the function of flowers. So today I want to tell you about uh, this project that I did this summer in collaboration uh, with um, Avery Russell and Carlos Nunes Pereira on the evolution and functional significance of uh, these structures characteristic of Solanum, the, the anthracones. Right, so the this is a, a super cool uh, genus of plants, and I, I'm sure I, I don't have to convince you of that. Uh, it's uh, evolutionarily diverse, contains uh, uh, more than 1,200 species, it's found uh, all over the place, uh, has a diversity of habit, habits, and uh, lives in very diverse places. But somehow, uh, for some people, the flowers are really boring. And they're really boring in a way because they are across the genus, they uh, conserve this uh, general morphology that has been even uh, become known as the, as the solanoid flower, the solanum like flower. And this uh, typical morphology is, uh, you know, um, uh, stellate uh, corolla with uh, five petals, uh, can be f um, uh, more or less distinct, but the, in the center they, they have this bright yellow. Um, male reproductive structures, mostly made by, by anthers, and then the, the stigma coming uh, through it to different extents. And um, it, it is uh, uh, thought that, that part of the reason why this uh, floor morphology is relatively conserved in the, in the group has to do with the function of the, of the flowers. And one of the, the things that I think is very important to highlight in the morphology of solanum flowers is that one of its uh, key characteristics is the type of anthers that they have. So, you know, in this slide, you can see on the right hand side of the slide, the typical um, uh, angiosperm anther that when it's mature, it will open through a longitudinal um, slit and it, this uh, opening uh, maturation exposes pollen grains passively to um, pollinator visits. Now on the left hand side of the slide you have the uh, typical 
tolanum anther that instead of opening when mature remains uh, closed and the only place uh, for pollen to come out is through these small apical pores that you can see uh, pointed out with a, with a white arrow. Now, there are variation on the, on the shape and the morphology of anthers, even within the genus Solanum, and some species, instead of tiny pores, they have uh, uh, larger pores or these uh, tear-shaped openings that uh, sort of um, start opening as, uh, with a slit towards the base of the anther. In some cases, the whole anther is um, the isn't a long, the longitudinal axis, but in general, uh, solanum flowers are characterized by having this tube-like structure that holds the pollen inside, uh, even when when the flower is is mature. And this characteristic of having tubular anthers is associated in solanum and in other groups with a very special type of pollination that you probably have uh, heard before, and this is uh, bus pollination. So this picture shows um, uh, an European bumblebee, Bombus terrestris, uh, vibrating a flower of a Mexican solanum, solanum citrullifolium, Mexico and, and southern uh, US. And as you can uh, see at the base of the picture, the vibrations that this bee is producing cause the pollen to come out of the, of the flower. Now this, this uh, uh, interaction between uh, behavior that bees produce, uh, these, these floral vibrations that they produce, and the type of uh, floral morphology is uh, what has given rise to the, to the pollination syndrome of bus pollination. And there, there are many uh, interesting aspects of bus pollination that I'm only going to touch very uh, briefly here. But basically, what you have here is a type of flower that is visited by a subset of animal visitors, in particular bees and, and female bees uh, uh, only. And these uh, bees, when they land on, on one of these types of flowers, they grab the anthers with the mandibles and then curl their body in this C shape that you can see in this uh, uh, classic diagram from uh, Mishner in the, in the 60s. And, and once the body is curled in the C position, then what happens is that the bee will begin vibrating and the vibration are going to cause the pollen to come out. Now, as I said, you, you probably heard this before and I, I'm not sure I, uh, you'll be able to, to hear this, but I, I'm going to play you a little uh, sound clip that shows um, a bee flying towards a flower and then landing and, and beginning uh, vibrating or, or buzzing. So ho hopefully you, you heard like a deep uh, pitch sound, which is a flight uh, uh, buzz, followed by a series of short um, high pitched uh, sounds. And th these are the, the floral vibrations that the bee is producing uh, to release pollen from these flowers. And there are many um, uh, quite cool things about the production of these vibrations, the mechanism by which bees uh, produce the, these vibrations. But in general, the vibrations uh, to remove pollen from flowers are produced by the same muscles that power fly. And these uh, muscles are illustrated here in, in a cartoon uh, from Snodgrass, uh, modified from Snodgrass, in this slide. And these big muscles in the thorax basically occupy the majority of the space of the thorax and cause the thorax to contract and deform uh, to both power flight when the uh, wings are um, uh, deployed or to vibrate uh, flowers when the wings are not deployed. And these muscles um, have a very peculiar characteristic, uh, which is that they are stretch activated. That means that they respond to uh, a stretch with another contraction. So at the bottom of this slide, you have um, an illustration of, of what this means for the, for the capacity to, to vibrate the, the thorax for bees. And basically what this uh, means is that the muscles can contract at a much uh, higher frequency or rate than the neural um, uh, impulses that are indicating it to contract. So a, a single electric potential from a neuron will cause a series of muscle contractions. Uh, as, as you can see in this uh, diagram at the bottom. 
And these thoracic uh, vibrations are associated not only with um, flight and with uh, pollen collection, but they're also involved in thermal regulation, uh, communication during mating, uh, communication uh, to uh, among nest mates to um, pass information on floral resources. They're used as an alarm signal to warn of predators and some bees and some wasps also use these type of vibrations to compact materials that are used in nest building. Now, I want to uh, uh, now go from the, the diagram to a uh, 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 micrograph, an animated macro micrograph of the bee's thorax to show you uh, these muscles that are causing post-pollination. So, this is a um, uh, x-ray micro CT scan uh, animation that um, conducted with some, some colleagues, um, uh, Fernando Montalegre and people in, in his lab, that basically zooms into the uh, bee's thorax and then in a, mo in a second it will zoom out of the bee's thorax and in, in this animation you can see um, as, the, as the image goes through the thorax these big big uh, thoracic muscles that cause the vibrations. You can see a pair that is appearing on the sides and then another pair in the center of the thorax. And it's the contraction of these muscles that cause the thorax to be to vibrate um, and uh, consequently the flower to vibrate as well. Now these uh, bee buses can be characterized with the same parameters that you characterized uh, other types of, of vibrations or um, this type of movement. You can describe them by their uh, timing uh, characteristics. So on the top left of the slide you have um, three short buses uh, produced when a bee is on a flower. And if you take the left hand side uh, bus and you look at the, at the frequency, at the pitch of the bus, you get a, a figure like the spectrogram on the top right, which has a single peak that reflects uh, its uh, fundamental or dominant frequency in this case. Uh, in this case, it's about 320 hertz or 320 cycles per second. And then you can combine this uh, timing and frequency information uh, with, with the magnitude to produce something like the diagram on the bottom left, which is a spectrogram, which shows um, in lighter colors the frequencies that ha have the highest uh, magnitude. So using things like timing and frequency and magnitude, you can characterize these uh, buses produced by insects in different behavioral contexts. Why is this important for us? Uh, is because the characteristics of these bus are a main determinant of the amount of pollen that a bee can extract from a flower. So in work that I conducted with um, my, my good friend and colleague, Paul De Luca, some years ago and, and others, uh, we uh, measured the amount of pollen that comes out under different types of vibrations. So we varied frequency, we varied the, the magnitude of the vibration, and, uh, in this case measured with, with velocity, we changed the, the duration. And we found that one of the key components um, that determine how much pollen comes out of the flower is the, the magnitude of the vibration, for example, measured uh, in, in ve as, as velocity in uh, millimeters per second. So the, the higher magnitude the vibration, the more pollen that comes out. It's surprisingly frequency, although it affects pollen release, it does so in a much uh, less important manner. It has a, a much um, a narrower effect than, than the magnitude of the vibration or the, or the frequency. Okay, so now, now that I've given you this uh, sort of background on, on the system on, on this type of pollination, what I want to uh, do is targeting the, the question that we address in this, in this study, and it basically centers around the, the issue of how does floral morphology affect this type of pollination. So I want to focus on one component of floral morphology that is uh, uh, familiar to, to all of you, which is the presence of these uh, cone-shaped structure in the center of the flowers of Solanum and, and other groups. So basically, if you, if you look at uh, bus pollinated uh, Solanum, you'll find that uh, they all produce this bright yellow aggregation of stamens in the center, but that the architecture of the, of the stamens, how they come together during development and, and after, uh, after that, uh, 
varieties. So on one hand, you have species like the one on the left hand side of the slide, in which the anthers, which are these uh, large uh, yellow structures in the photo, are um, held by the, by the filament on to the corolla of the flower, but, but are otherwise free to move. So each individual anther can move independently to some extent to the other ones. Okay, there is no, no, no joining of the uh, anther walls. In contrast, you have other types of plants, like the one illustrated here with uh, Solanum dulcamara on the right hand side of the picture, in which the anthers are um, uh, joined or fused together uh, through different mechanisms, so that the whole androecium is now functioning as a single um, joint unit. Now, these uh, joint uh, anther cones have evolved in Solanum and related taxa multiple times. This is a very small uh, um, part of the phylogeny of using species that I uh, regularly work with, uh, obtained uh, thanks to the generous help of, of Tina um, uh, Sarkinen, uh, that ha points out two independent origins of these joint anther cones. One in Solanum lycopersicum and one in Solanum dulcamara. If you zoom out, you'll find other examples of joint anther cones, these fused ones like the dulcamara one, uh, within Solanum and, and its close relatives. But what is really cool is that these joint anther cones have also evolved in other families, including the ones listed on the bottom right of the, of the slide. So this is a, a morphology that, that has repeatedly evolved in unrelated uh, groups of plants. Now, in a, in a very uh, cool and uh, thought-provoking paper, Beverly Glover and colleagues uh, described the morphology and the developmental uh, basis of these uh, anthracons. And what they um, documented really, really nicely is that even within the genus Solanum, the independent origins of anthracons are achieved through different uh, mechanisms. So, for example, the um, anthers of Solanum dulcamara are joined together by extracellular secretions that uh, basically glue the anthers together. So these are smooth structures, as you can see in the SEM picture on the top, that are uh, glued together by this bioadhesive. In contrast, uh, tomato and its relatives uh, have joint anther cones that are held together by small trichomes that I imagine them like, like a zipper that that holds them together. So um, you have here a nice example how the same morphology has evolved independently through different mechanisms, even within the genus uh, Solan. And um, Beverly uh, Glover and colleagues proposed a, a, a series of ideas of what are the functional consequences for, for having joint anthracones. And the ideas have to do with the, how the flower interacts with the floral visitor, in this case a bee. So when you have free, uh, free anthers, the, the bee might uh, uh, interact in one way. When you have fused anthers or joint anthers, it might interact in the other way. Now, this is uh, the motivation for, for our study. What we wanted to do was to gather um, evidence to help us understand what are the functional consequences of joint anther cones. And as far as we know, there, there was no previous um, experimental uh, approach to, to try to, to find out why, what's the function or test this hypothesis of what is the function of joint anthracones. So we address two uh, basic questions. How do vibrations experienced by anthers differ between these free and joint anther architectures? And how does this anther fusion affect pollen release? And before going uh, further, I just want to uh, thank again my two collaborators in this project, uh, Carlos Nunes Pereira, who is uh, doing a postdoctoral fellowship in my lab at Sterling, and uh, Avery Russell at Missouri State University, uh, who, uh, who agreed to, to uh, join me in, in, this, uh, in this little project. So in order to uh, try to get at the, at the functional significance of this morphology, um, we focused on three species of solanum that differ to some extent on the, on the uh, anther morphology that they have. We looked at solanum melagnifolium, this uh, perennial um, herbaceous weed 
from the Americas that uh, produces anthers that are relatively uh, free. In fact, they may begin uh, um, a little bit close together and as the flower ages, the anthers separate even further. So here you have a middle aged flower on the top left of the slide. We also use Solanum cisimbrifolium, which is a, a South American um, herbaceous plant that also produces these free anther configurations in which uh, at least the plants that we've seen, there is also to some extent a, a continuous spreading of the anthers as the, as the flower ages. And finally, we looked at another um, uh, species of Solanum, Solanum pyracanthus, a uh, species endemic to Madagascar, but uh, easily available uh, because of its, uh, uh, you know, the beautiful flowers and shocking bright yellows uh, and orange spines. And in, in this case, you have an anther cone that is not joined. There are no bioadhesives or trichomes that hold it together, but the anthers throughout the lifespan of the flower remain closely pressed together. Okay, so they're all, they all can move independently, but they're still presented uh, throughout the life of the, of the plant, of the flower, sorry, uh, pressed together. So using these three species, what we did was to set up two experimental treatments. Uh, one in which we maintain the natural anther configuration illustrated here with Solanum cisimbrifolium. In this case, the, the flower was manipulated, as I'll describe next, uh, but retained that, um, in this case, uh, free anther architecture. And the other treatment, we artificially or experimentally created a joint anther cone. And the way we did this, was by applying a small amount of um, water soluble, water-based glue to the edge of each anther and then ho uh, holding them together until they dried so that you effectively end up with a, with a fused cone, much like the one you get in, um, uh, or similar to the one you get in Dulcamara or even um, tomato. For the natural anther configuration, uh, we also applied a little bit of glue to the anther, the, trying to get it to the same amount as in the joint anther cones, but, but the anthers remain free. Okay, it was just uh, applied in a different part. And here's um, a picture uh, showing you on the left, the natural configuration of the anthers of these three species, and on the right, this joint anther configuration after the experimental treatment. And you can see that uh, for both Cisimbrifolium and Elagnifolium, this results in, in, a, in a change in the architecture of the anther cone. Uh, but in Pyracanthus, the change is more subtle. The change is that uh, they are uh, now uh, held together, but otherwise they look similar. And then uh, the first, to answer the first question of how does this uh, experimental treatment affect the transmission of vibrations in the flower, we set up this little um, experiment. So what we had was um, a, a flower illustrated here to show you just two anthers that in the case of the um, joint treatment has glue held, holding the anthers together. And we um, then inserted a, a metallic pin to uh, one of the anthers. And that pin uh, was um, attached to a shaker that produced vibrations of similar characteristics to those produced by a bumblebee uh, on a flower and we're able to, to control these vibrations very precisely and measure the, um, their characteristics uh, using, using sensors. But basically what we were doing was vibrating one of the anthers uh, through a pin inserted at the base of the anther. And then uh, to look at how these vibrations travel to other anthers, we used a, a laser Doppler vibrometer that produces a beam that can measure vibrations without contact and we pointed and uh, we aimed that laser beam to uh, another anther away from the place where we were shaking and we, we put it uh, we measured the, the vibrations in the, in the tip so this is the, di uh, the diagram this is um, how it looked in um, uh, real life so you can see uh, at the base you have the shaker pin uh, penet uh, penetrating one of the anthers and we try that in every case um, the the, uh, the shaker pin uh, is attached to the anther label here, number one. And then you can see the, the shining of the red laser on one of the distal anthers, which depending on the flower was either anther three or an anther four. Okay, so we always apply the vibrations and measure the vibrations in, in the same 
the same way. So now let me um, jump uh, quickly to the to the results. So I'm first going to show you the vibrations that are transmitted to the distal anther. Okay, so we apply the same vibrations to the to the anther with the pin, and we measure it with the laser in the other anther. And I'm going to show you the results for the two treatments and for each of the three species. And you can uh, see from, from this uh, diagram that there is a clear difference in the uh, magnitude of the vibrations transmitted to this distal anther between the free treatment and the joint treatment. We measure vibrations uh, uh, as root mean square velocity. Um, it is not too important exactly the, the units for this. But you can see here, for example, for eliacnifolium, the joint experimental treatment uh, ends up transmitting much more vibrations than the free experimental treatment. The same is for the case for uh, C. brifolium, the white flower species, and similarly, although maybe to a lesser extent, in Pyracanthus, that purple flower that has um, the, the uh, closely held together anthers. Okay, so so now that we established that the vibrations indeed change when uh, you have an anther cone, a joint anther cone, what we wanted to do is to see how this translates to function. In particular, how does this translate to pollen release? So uh, following each vibration, we capture the pollen on a, on a plastic plate at, uh, below the, the flower and then collected that pollen with a piece of jelly, uh, dissolved that jelly, and put the sample through a particle counter, an uh, electronic particle counter. And using this method, we were able to count uh, several hundred thousand uh, pollen grains for the three species. And I'm showing you here just a histogram of the distribution of, of pollen grain size for each of the three species. You can see that more, all species have this uh, 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 higher uh, um, uh, value uh, pollen grains which represent the viable pollen grains and some of them to different extents have a second peak of smaller uh, particles and these represent um, inviable pollen grains because we weren't interested in um, difference in viability or anything like that but just how much pollen comes out we combined these types of pollen together and, and count them um, as a single, single thing and this is what we found uh, for two species Solanum eliagnifolium and Solanum cisimbrifolium, experimentally joining the anthers into a fused cone results in more pollen released okay, compared to the free configuration. For the third species, we don't find that uh, effect on pollen release. So we found no significant difference in pollen release between the free and the joint uh, anther configurations. And this may be not entirely um, unexpected, given that uh, Solanum pyracanthus is the one that has the anthers uh, already in, in close contact. Okay, so uh, what I've showed you um, is that these joint anther cones enable a better transmission of vibrations between the anther where you apply the vibrations and other anthers, and that in uh, two species that have these spreading anthers, the conversion to an anther cone results in, in an increased release of pollen grains than in the free configuration. As I said, in the, the third species, Pyracanthus, the uh, experimental fusion of the anthers increases vibration, but does not have an effect on pollen release. Okay, so now for the last uh, three slides, I, I wanna finish by uh, speculating a little bit about uh, when should free versus joint anther architectures uh, evolve. And we have a, come up with a, a couple of, of hypotheses, and I would really love to hear your, your thoughts on this, of, of when should this be the case. So uh, we propose that having free anther cones can um, act to reduce the wastage of pollen or the uh, theft of pollen when you have certain type of visitors. So during the interaction between bus pollinators uh, and these plants, some uh, bus pollinating bees are uh, relatively small compared to the, to the size of the flower. And because of that, as you can see in the picture, they don't necessarily contact the uh, female sexual organs. So they can remove pollen from anthers, but they don't really deposit pollen on that flower. So they behave effectively as, uh, as, as pollen thieves. So we uh, hypothesize that having free anthers might uh, help plants 
to reduce the amount of pollen that these type of pollinators release. How do they do it? Because the vibrations applied on one anther, as you can see in the picture, are uh, less effectively transmitted to the other anther. So, it, so the pollinator is uh, extracting pollen from one or a subset of the anthers, not uh, all of them. Okay, now a second uh, hypothesis for the evolution of joint anthers is that this might uh, improve the unimodal deposition of pollen on the pollinator's body. It's very simple, you bring together all the, all the anthers, you put all the pores in, in the same location, and this causes that the pollen is uh, released, uh, when it's released upon vibrations, it lands on more or less one region of the body. And the, the, this unimodal pollen deposition is contrasted in this picture with a species that has three anthers and, and two types of anthers that deposit the pollen in two different parts of the, of the body. So you can see a set of short anthers here, the feeding anthers, that are depositing pollen on the, on the ventral side of the bee. And this other elongated anther that is visiting, um, sorry, depositing pollen on the uh, dorsal part of the abdomen of this, of this bee. So this uh, uh, multimodal or bimodal pollen deposition uh, cannot occur with fused anthers, uh, but instead you, you, you put them uh, more or less in one single spot. And finally, um, another hypothesis is that uh, joint anthers are a mechanism that increases the amount of pollen uh, released by any pollinator. So even um, uh, larger bees when visiting a flower uh, will transmit vibrations more effectively across the anther cone and consequently increase the release of pollen uh, per visit. So in conditions where uh, increasing pollen release is beneficial, then fused anther cones or joint anther cones may be advantageous. Okay. Okay, so this is a... Uh, uh, the story I wanted to present to you on this um, experiment that we conducted uh, over over this summer. And with that, I'd just like to thank uh, again, Carlos and Avery for uh, working on, on this project with me, as well as uh, uh, in particular Lucy Never, who um, uh, gave uh, excellent uh, ideas and uh, suggestions in the very early stages of this, of this uh, project. And, um, in a way, the, the study is motivated by some uh, experiments that Lucy did and that have been recently published in scientific uh, reports. So I, I, I recommend, uh, uh, if you have time to, an interest uh, to check at her paper, as well as uh, other people, Andrea Echeverry and Spencer Barrett for sharing seed material, Fernando and Sarah for the uh, X-ray micro CT uh, analysis. And if you uh, wanna, uh, read more about this experiment, we have a bio archive per print uh, on this address. And thanks to my funding sources, the Liberhume Trust. Thank you. Thanks, Mario. That was a great talk. I'm sure there'll be questions. It looks like there's a, a question forming in the chat. So uh, for everybody, you can either type um, question in the chat and I and I can just call on you and you can turn on your microphone or if you'd rather me read the questions I can just read them from if you want to type the whole thing so looks like we we have a uh, question from Boris so he said great talk Mario I wonder whether free anther occurrence is associated with smaller simultaneous displays Oh yeah, okay, here's the whole question. I wonder whether free anther occurrence is associated with smaller simultaneous displays. Yeah. Does that mean uh, just a question? Does it mean smaller inflorescences? So smaller number of flowers at the same time, right? Just to, for dummies. Yeah, I, uh, that, yes. that's a really, really, really good question, uh, as, as usual, Boris. Thank you very much. I, I think, it, you know, you uh, like Tina said, you could uh, read it as just a smaller number uh, of flowers, but also like smaller uh, corollas. I mean, in a way, my in my account uh, uh, equivalently, and it's it's a really good suggestion. And I do not know uh, whether that that is the case. I mean, in 
uh, solanum uh, dulcamara and tomatoes you can and wild tomatoes you can have multiple flowers open at the same time in a single inflorescence uh, I would defer to uh, people that know these plants in the field better like uh, like you know uh, uh, Boris or uh, or, or Pat maybe to tell us if it's something like, really striking but from the top of my head I I don't remember any drastic difference between the free and the joint uh, anther configurations in terms of either flower size or flower number or uh, please and if you, if you have other uh, uh, if you disagree or you want to say something uh, yeah I'd love, love to hear Lynn might have some, but I can't think of any because I know some that are small flowers and very spread anthers, strikingly so, and you just go, wow, crazy. And they all, many flowers in a relatively large inflorescence at the same time in a geminator clay, Solanum clivorum. And then, so I don't see any relationship, but Lynn knows a lot more of the spreading types, maybe. Awesome. Um, well, I guess we can move on to the, the next question that's in the chat, unless anybody else has any more comments or thoughts on that. Feel free to hop in. Um, so Dick Olmsted, let's see, sorry, I lost the chat here, um, said, fascinating talk, Mario. I always wondered why there was such anther variation in selenum. How many times has the fused anther cone conformation evolved in selenum? Yes, uh, thank you very much. That, that's, a, that's a really great question. I think, uh, I think I counted three independent origins, uh, but they haven't been, uh, properly mapped as, as, as far as I know, then this is within Solanum. And then thanks to coming uh, uh, to the Solanese seminars, I also learned that uh, Lysianthus is another uh, independent origin. And there might be more than one uh, independent origins in Lysianthus. I just don't, don't know the, the group well enough. So within Solanum and the closely related taxa, there are, uh, as far as I know, at least four confirmed origins of this morphology. And who knows, there are probably uh, more uh, out there. Awesome. So let's see, we have another question from Stacy. I don't know if you're reading these questions in the chat as well. I, I can. I, uh, please, no, go, go for it because I, I got a bit lost on where the Okay, question. yeah. Um, so Stacy said, I loved this talk. My question is, how common is functional slash morphological divergence among anthers in free anther species? My sense is that it's not so common, which would suggest other drivers. Yes. Uh, thanks, Stacey. That's, that's a really good point. I, I think they're, they're rare. Uh, strong morphological differences in free anthers, uh, if free anther flowers are rare. In general, you know, things like uh, etherantry and other types of uh, dimorphism or, or, or polymorphism within the flower are rare. Uh, but I don't know if that really sort of invalidates the unimodal hypothesis of pollen deposition, if, if that's what um, uh, Stacy Stacy means. Because even even with um, uh, with a single type of anther, uh, homogeneous uh, morphology of, of anthers in the flower, you do get uh, a different dispersal of pollen or placement of pollen on the pollinator's body depending on how they are um, arranged. I, I think maybe in, in solanum that tend to have uh, the anthers in the center of the flower is less dramatic, the example, but if you look at other bus pollinated taxa, um, for example, in the family Melastomatesi, in some cases, the spread of the anthers can be very, very dramatic and can can um, uh, can occur even without anther differentiation. It's just by, by where they, they point in the flower. Cool. Um, let's see, it looks like Lynn has a few questions. You wanna just- Great. Go for it. Yes, I would. Mario, that was a great talk. It's so nice to see you and nice to see everyone. Um, I have a, and, and I owe you some Lysianthes seeds, by the way. I haven't, 
<laughs> thank you. Thank but you. I'll, I'll send them to you for sure because we Thanks. need to investigate buzz pollination. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. I'll see what's going on there. Um, first of all, I'm I'm wondering if you're suggesting, or if your experiments suggest that, at least in some cases, the free anther situation in Solanum species is is an adaptation towards being pollinated by little tiny bees that visit each anther separately. Um, and I think your experimental results suggest this. Whereas the fused cones are maybe a specialization towards big bees that would tend to buzz the whole cone. Yes. Am I getting that right? Or is yeah, that I, I think I think we're we're thinking along the, the same lines. One of the my favorite parts of the of the interpretation of our results is that the selection for the different anther configurations really depends on this ecological context of who and what kind of pollinators are there. So I can imagine that things like the size of the pollinator, uh, as it mediates whether it contacts the sexual organs or not, might be a strong uh, selective pressure on what type of anther is um, evolves. Also, the the behavior of these pollinators. For example, you you might have um, bees that are particularly good at, at uh, rubbing pollen grains without uh, uh -huh. pollinating. And if these pollen fields occur at a high frequency in the population, in that case, as you are uh, suggesting, then what I would expect is that the free anther configuration is favored as a mechanism to reduce pollen theft. Mm -hmm. While mm -hmm. um, this might not necessarily be a, a, a uh, morphology that is favored if pollen theft is rare and you have the right size of, of pollinators. So yes, I totally agree with you that both size and the relative uh, occurrence of these different types of pollinators is going to be important. Well, that's I, I find this extremely interesting because um, without real quantitative data, you know, selenium is huge compared to other genera in the Solanaceae and, you know, compared to other angiosperm genera. But then if we look over in this same kind of phylogenetic region of the Solanaceae, we also have Lysianthes, which is a relatively large genus. You know, it's got, let's say, 150 to 200 species. And its sister genus is Capsicum that only has about 40, and it has longitudinal anther dehiscence. You know, so that just speculating and, um, you know, drinking beer and talking, you might say that, that there's something about having anthropores that promotes diversification. But what that is, is something that has always confounded me because the morphology of the andresium in, in, sol in buzz pollinated solanum flowers doesn't seem very specialized. But in fact, maybe the specialization that might promote diversification has to do with extreme pollinator specialization that we just haven't studied very well. Yes, I, 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 I agree. I think there is a, a lot more to, to investigate here. And, and I, I'm really glad you mentioned this uh, effect on, on, on diversification because this is something that uh, we're um, interested in as well. And uh, this summer I, I presented a, a talk with you know, preliminary results of a phylogenetic analysis of the uh, occurrence of porcelain flowers and diversification. And we're still working through the, the final versions of the paper, but hopefully we have something to, to share with, um, with you guys soon. But the, the short um, answer that we found in our analysis is that there is an effect of the evolution of porcelain anthers on diversification, but this is the uh, context dependent. It, it happens in some families, but not in other families. So you have the same trait that means different things for diversification across, across angiosperms. And, um, and I, I promise I'll get on to the uh, writing okay. of that paper soon because I, I owe it to my collaborators. That's fascinating. So please keep me in the loop of that research. I have one more little short question. I'm sorry, everybody, to dominate here. Um, I was wondering about also the effects of exerted styles and stigmas on your experiments um, because it looks like uh, in Cisimbria following, maybe it was that the style is sticking out through the cone. And so if that has an effect on, on buzz pollination. Yes, uh, great, great question. So we, 
the three species that I um, that we looked are Andromonesis. So we have uh -huh. both uh, hermaphrodite flowers with the style sticking out and staminate flowers uh, with, with the very reduced style. And I, I in the analysis I looked at whether they, they made any difference for pollen release and I couldn't find uh, any effect. So I think at the end we analyzed them all together. In part might be because the in solanum in general uh, the stigma is really small, relatively small. Mm -hmm. You can in Cicimbri phonum is not the, that small, and this is a very interesting species because of its um, self incompatibility, at least in, in some populations. But um, the truth is not we we haven't looked in enough detail at how uh, characteristics of of the style and the stigma in hermaphroditic species might affect pollen release. We, in andromnitious plants, it seems that it sometimes makes a difference for uh, pollen export, uh, but not, not in all species. Okay, thank you. Really, really cool talk. And just wanted to say shout out to all you Solanaceae people. It's wonderful to see you. Thanks. All right. Looks like we've, we've got a couple more questions in the chat. So one from uh, Natalia. Thank you for your talk. It was great. I was wondering, how do you measure the total basal level of pollen? Does some of it get released without the presence of the pollinator? And when you insert the pin, does some of it get lost in that manipulation? Yes. Uh, excellent, excellent question. So it, in the results I show you, it's just the absolute number of pollen grains removed rather than the proportion that, that was available. But in, in other studies, we have uh, counted how many pollen grains remain in the anther and obtained uh, proportional uh, values as well. For this study, we felt that uh, it, it was uh, more interesting to look at the, at the number of pollen grains, uh, but there surely is going to be variation in the total amount of pollen grains. So uh, the, these numbers, if you put them in a proportional scale, might, might be different. But what is important is that our comparisons are within species, which have the, set, you know, the flowers have the same amount of pollen uh, more or less. So in that case, that, that contrast in, in treatment will hold, but the, the uh, value of the y-axis will change between, if you compare between species. And the second uh, question of uh, whether the, the piercing with a pin uh, causes pollen to come out, the answer is um, I, I can definitely say no. And it's because, imagine it like this, the skin of, a, of an orange that is uh, pierced by a, by a hypodermic needle. When you remove it, the turgidity of the tissue closes that uh, gap. So there is no pollen coming out from, from the hole that, that, we, that we make. But great, really great questions. Cool. Um, let's see, one more question that's been typed in the chat from Gregory. I wonder uh, what the relative pollen uh, dispensing might play within the anthers. So something like S uh, Buchmann did on Selenum and Gretchen Laboon did with some other species. Most of the dioecious species of Selenum from Australia have free anthers and are visited by large buzzing bee pollinators as well as tiny single anther no buzz andrina. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for, for that uh, great uh, question from Professor Anderson. And uh, we have looked at pollen dispensing a la, uh, the same style as uh, Steve Buchmann in other, other species. Uh, during Kemp, uh, a former postdoc in my lab, uh, um, and I looked at three, uh, three pairs of species of Solanum, Section and Drosteras, and looked at uh, the proportion of pollen removed upon uh, consecutive buses. And as it had been documented in, in um, other, other Solanum by, by uh, Steve and other species uh, by others, we find a, a strong dispensing uh, effect so that most of the pollen comes out in the first few buses. So if you, if you imagine a, a graph of amount of proportion of pollen removed and a consecutive bus on the, on the X, on the X axis, you find a very uh, steep curve. But the shape of that curve varies between uh, plants of different morphologies. So that uh, outcrossing flowers or species that are putatively outcrossing with large flowers tend to have um, uh, like a, like a um, shallower curve. Okay, so it takes more buses to remove the same proportion of pollen uh, 
than self-pollinating small flower taxa in which the majority of the pollen is removed in the very first uh, buses. And if you are, you are interested in, in these um, uh, details, uh, the, the paper from Jurin was published a couple of months ago in American uh, Journal of, Bot of Botany and it has uh, more, more details about this uh, pollen dispensing uh, effect, which is, is really, really cool. We, we found that uh, you can boss a flower as much as you want and you remove a, a fraction of the pollen. If you wait a day and you boss it again, there will be more pollen to be removed. So there is a combination of dispensing that occurs through the pores and also through the uh, maturation of pollen inside the anther. Awesome. Uh, looks like we have, have a question from, from Tina. So what would be the effect of spreading anthers, i.e. free, when the pore would be pointing away from the style and stigma? Would this be about avoiding selfing and how would pollen from other individuals from the same species get onto the stigma in those cases? Yeah, this is a, a really cool idea and, and something that when we were writing the, the, the paper, we, uh, we discussed like, what's the effect of this uh, uh, anther fusion to, to selfing uh, effectively? And we, I don't have a, a, a very uh, solid answer on this. What, what I think is that most of the outcrossing will occur as the pollinator uh, lands on the flower and before any buzzing has occurred. So the, the position of the anthers will affect outcrossing or incoming pollen to the extent that it positions the pollinator in their, near the stigma. Now, after it's landed and, and when it buzzes, I think the key um, morphological feature that determines how much cell pollen is deposited on the stigma is probably the distance between the anther pores and the, and the stigma. So you could have a joint anther architecture with a very long style and that probably uh, solves little or you can have a free anther architecture with a relatively short style and that might solve more. So, so I, I think they are in a way disentangled or uh, yeah, related, but, but not necessarily um, uh, connected. All right, great. Um, yeah, I got a lot of questions. Um, I don't see any more in the chat. If anybody wants to ask a question, go ahead and let me know. Tina had a question. She wrote one. Oh, that was the question I just read. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't know if anybody else has a question. If not, um, yeah, thanks a lot, Mario, for coming. And that was a super, super great talk. So, uh, and uh, um, it's been recorded, so it'll be up on YouTube if anybody wants to go back and watch it again. Th um, thank you, very, thank you, thank you very much uh, for all the great questions and, and the invitation. And if any of you have uh, pollinator observations of Solanum in, in the wild, um, uh, I would love to hear about it because th I think this is uh, one of the, the gaps that we have in this uh, pollination story. We had a lot of experiments in the, in the lab and on a few species uh, in the field, but uh, anything that you can th send my way uh, for pollinator visitation in, in the wild, I'd, be, I'd appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, I've put your uh, Twitter handle on the this, this the slide for the for the video on YouTube so people have an easy place to find it. Um, yeah, so thanks again. And um, just so while everyone's still here, next week we'll have uh, Michael Jakovic from Ohio State University. I'm not sure what the title of that talk is yet, but um, tune in and uh, should know. It should be up on the website pretty soon. So um, yeah, thanks everyone. Great, we'll thank see you. See you next Bye, time. Everybody.